Hi, I'm Charlie Melcher, and I'm the founder of the Future of Storytelling Summit. I'd like to welcome you to today's Future of Storytelling speaker series. This speaker series and the summit itself are devoted to better understanding how technology is impacting and changing the way we tell stories in the broadest sense of the word. Through the power of Google Plus Hangouts, we bring our summit speakers back to lead weekly roundtable conversations in this open forum. Um, we're incredibly excited today to have with us Corey May. Hey, Corey. Corey Are was. You hearing me all right? Yes, we hear you fine. Welcome. Okay, so, uh, Corey is the director of scriptwriters at Alice, Ubisoft's narrative studio. He's worked on many of their sort of mega hits Prince of Persia, The Warrior Within, The Two Thrones, Assassin's Creed, and, and many others at Ubisoft. Um, as well as having worked before that at titles for Electronic Arts and Warner Brothers Interactive. Corey was one of our speakers this year at the 2013 uh, Foss Summit, and we're really psyched to have you with us today, Corey. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, now, Jamin's going to be our moderator today, so Jamin Warren, why don't you introduce yourself and, and say hi to everybody. Hello, uh, my name is Jamin Warren. I'm the founder of Killscreen, a video game, uh, video game arts and culture company based in Brooklyn. Um, originally started as a, as a reporter at the Wall Street Journal, got really interested in uh, the future of games, and am very happy to be uh, moderating for you all. I, I believe we're going to show a, uh, a short video of Corey's work, and then, yeah, we'll jump into some introductions. <laughs> Is traditional entertainment tells a single story, the story of a protagonist of a fictional world and the characters that create it. When you're dealing with a game, you actually find yourself in a position where you're telling two stories. It's the story of the player and the story of the protagonist. And the story of the protagonist concerns itself primarily with more traditional forms of entertainment. And this is all about the fictional universe that's created, the characters that inhabit it, the locations where it's based, the events that unfold, the reasons that people do what they do within that space. And games also concern themselves with the player story. And those are the rules and regulations, the mechanics, the design that govern interaction in the virtual space where games take place. So we've got these two stories. We have the player story and the protagonist story. And one of the problems, challenges that we run into during production is that these two stories are often framed as being in competition with one another. And I think it's very important that moving forward, and this is something that I spend a lot of my time here at Ubisoft working on, is trying to bring these two stories into a place where uh, they're collaborating rather than competing with each other. Something we try and work on is trying to find a way to match drama with mechanics so that everything that's being designed for the game is being designed in service of a singular thing. Lovely. That was a great, that was a great clip. I know Corey spent a lot of time working on that. Um, so we, we have joining Corey uh, a bunch of esteemed folks from, from the world of games. I guess, uh, Susan, let's start with you if you want to give a brief uh, you know, one to two line intro of you and your work. Sure, I'll keep it short because there's a lot of people here. I am a, um, I'm a writer. I write primarily for video games. I've worked on a couple of different titles. I worked on the Bioshock series. I worked on Far Cry 2 from Ubisoft Montreal and uh, Tomb Raider. And I really am interested in like exactly what Corey talks about. How do you bring the player's story and the protagonist's story together so they resonate instead of clash? Nick, we have Nicholas Fortuno. Do you want to give us a, a brief bio on, on yourself and your work? Sure. Um, I'm a game designer, and I've been a game designer for about a dozen years. Uh, I run a company called Climatics, where we do game, both innovative games, serious games, and interactive narrative work, which we've done for a variety of clients, including uh, AMC, Disney, BBC, as well as the most recent project for Cronenberg Retrospective. Um, I also teach game design and interactive narrative at Parsons New School of Design. Lovely. And last up, we have uh, Stefan. Uh, Stefan, if you want to give a, a brief intro to you and your work. I think Stefan is having technical difficulties. Yeah. Corey, Corey, can you give an introduction <laughs> on <laughs> Stefan's behalf? <laughs> Stefan is currently uh, what we call director and metier of design here at Ubisoft, which is, I guess, sort of like saying he's in charge of overseeing all the designers and charting their path forward. So he and I actually wind up uh, working together quite a bit these days, trying to find that nexus again between uh, you know, player story, protagonist story, narrative and gameplay. Uh, and prior to that, he worked at a place called Saba, which uh, specialized in transmedia and uh, narrative opportunities. I hope I did him justice. <laughs> I, give me a thumbs up. 
I'm, I'm, I'm sure he's doing. I'm sure he's fine with your introduction. I guess you could speak on his behalf as well. If that's, uh, I don't know if that's easier as well. Hey, um, hey, Corey. Let me just jump in and say, Corey, it was a little hard to hear you. Okay. So if you can speak more directly into the mic or put a headset on. I, uh, I am. Is this any better? I'm trying to get as close as I can to the microphone. It's a little better. Um, okay. Well, I mean, I guess I mean I wanted to ask a question to the group um, you know, before we get started. Um, are I mean this is a controversial question for some, but you know we think about games as having this direct lineage to to film or to television or to to other narrative uh, to other narrative uh, mediums. I was wondering for you all, do games? Do you think that games actually do they count as stories? Uh, maybe Corey, if you want to start. So, I mean, obviously I'm biased. I, I absolutely believe that they count as stories. Uh, I think in some ways they are far more interesting uh, or at least present far more interesting opportunities than most traditional forms of narrative or media. Uh, that interactive axis that we're always talking about, the fact that games respond to your input uh, and then react to, to what you're doing within that world, I think really helps differentiate them and it, it increases immersion um, you know, in a way that most traditional passive media Either, either won't or, or can't. So I absolutely believe that games uh, are stories, just at least by the, the, you know, the nature of the fact that they create experiences every time. That, what, that term immersion, what do, you, what do you mean by that term? So for me, immersion is that ability to, to sort of bring the member of the audience into the fictional universe that you've created. Right? So the more that the, the, the constructed world begins to feel like the real world, or at least a, a temporary reality for, for the uh, viewer or participant, that, that to me is immersion. Hmm. Uh, Nick, what do you think? I mean, do you think that games count as, count as stories? Would you classify them as stories when you're describing them to, to other people? I mean, games can be stories. They don't have to be stories. I think Tetris is in the story. Chess is in the story. Moncala is in the story. I mean, the system can just be a, a, a sort of generative play experience that creates a sort of strategic landscape. Um, and I would argue that, you know, this to the to the player versus protagonist point, there are desire sets that come out of games that aren't very story related at all. You know, desires to win. Uh, you know, frustration and struggle. Like these aren't story experiences. They're 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 really game challenge experiences. But that said, games can be leveraged to tell stories, and they can all their mechanics can be used to tell stories effectively. So I think that game there are games that are stories. Um, there are games that have stories, and there are games that have nothing to do with story at all. And it really you know much like other media that aren't na naturally narrative media but can be narrative, things like painting or dance. Like, we can leverage the mechanics of the art form to tell stories, or we cannot, but I think calling the whole category game, like, of game stories is probably not accurate to a lot of games that exist. Right. Uh, well, so for, so for Susan, that's interesting for you, because obviously you're working as a writer, and you're probably not, you know, pending the story for Tetris or for Candy Crush Saga. For you, like, how, do you, how does your particular approach jive with kind of this sort of uh, unique relationship that games have with narrative? Yeah, I, I think of games as dreams. Like, I think that we do apply some kind of a storyline, whether it's robust or it's very thin. Humans just tell stories to themselves to make sense of the world. It's how we navigate. And uh, to Corey's point, they are immersive in the same way that dreams are immersive. And I think that the player is going to apply a story, whether there's one there or not. And so the job of any storyteller like myself or, or Corey is to find a way to create a, a, a story experience inside the world that resonates with the dream that the player is telling himself while he plays. So, so then how do you, I mean, I guess for, for all of you, what happens when those two, you know, I might dream of being, you know, let's say like an amazing space marine or, uh, you know, an amazing pirate or something like that, but the reality is I, you know, in games I often struggle to do that. I die often. How do you do, how do you, how do you, I don't know, how do you reconcile my desire to be amazing and the reality that I'm often not. <laughs> Susan, maybe if you want to, I don't know, yeah, how, for you as well, a writer, how do you... Right. Well, there's a couple of things. Number one, I, I think it's really helpful to understand how players think about things like death, which uh, you experience in a game so much differently than you do in real life. Uh, it's a mechanic and it's a, it's a concept. Um, and for me, the the way that I've been able to crack that nut of how do you sort of like provide a fantasy to the player while still dealing with the reality that it, A, he's learning how to play the game, and B, it's just a game, it's make-believe, 
uh, is to create a relationship between the avatar and the player. I really think about it like a road trip. And uh, the player is driving the car, and the avatar is in the passenger seat, and the avatar is in charge of like the radio, buying the snacks and the gas, uh, telling the jokes, like being a good uh, friend, being a good uh, companion. Gotcha. I, I, and what happens, I guess, if you have a bad companion who's along? What happens to the players then? I'm sorry. Can you say that again? What happens if you end up with a bad companion? I suppose for the road. Like, what's at stake there? Right. Well, well, then, then the player's story and gameplay changes, right? Because as soon as you sort of like break that break that fantasy, uh, the player usually becomes really adversarial towards his own avatar and like looks for ways to break the game. At least this has been my experience watching. A, watching other players, and B, being a player myself. You know, I remember playing Hitman and um, getting stuck in a hallway and spending probably 20 minutes, like, working on my dance moves in the hallway when I was supposed to be, you know, assassinating, you know, I was supposed to be killing somebody. But I just didn't care about the storyline or the character, so I was like, I'm going to make this guy do what I want to do. And, and I, yeah. I, I, Susan so raised goes, a really interesting point, and it's something that I think that we work on you know, all the time, is how do you maintain a sense of, of challenge without, uh, you know, breaking that, that connection between the, the player and the protagonist. And there's this back and forth, right? Some people will sometimes swing towards increased automation or increased opportunities for recovery from failure, and then you'll have a certain subset of the gaming audience become irate because now all of a sudden the game is much too easy and you know, what am I doing? I, I came into this whole challenge and everything's on rails and it's, it's you know, automating the process for me. And then on the flip side, you know, sometimes people define their experience by difficulty. There's a brand of games known as the uh, Dark Soul games and the sequel's actually coming out next week. And they pride themselves and define themselves and excite people with the fact that it's a game where you fail a lot. And in fact, in that game, the narrative itself supports the idea of dying constantly and restarting, right? The, the context is that you are in this sort of purgatory where where death and, and resurrection are a big part of the, the mechanic of not just the game, but of existing in that fictional universe. Yeah, and I think that when you, when you look at that, you, when you look at games that have done that successfully, you often find the games that we look at as, as really good narrative games, right? Like Planescape Format, Prince of Sands of Time, Dark Souls, like these are games that people point to as good examples of game narrative, and I think one of the reasons why is because they narrativize the things that you have to do in the game, which is like dialogue. Um, and, and to that extent, I think there is this kind of natural connection. I think that where the player story, you know, to kind of jump on what Susan was saying, where the player story and the protagonist story differ is that the protagonist's concern about success is not the same as the player's concern about success, because in the, in the narrative of the protagonist, the protagonist probably can't fail. Like, Jet Li can't die in the martial arts movie that Jet Li stars in. Jet Li has to get to the end. The player can die, and Jet Li can die. I mean, he, you know, narratively, he could die, but he's not going to. But the player is, and that, that differentiation is where this starts to fall apart, because if the player starts to perceive that what they're doing as just beating a challenge independent of the narrative, then they're no longer immersed in the narrative anymore. They start to deconstruct outside of the narrative. And so that balancing act, I think, is really crucial to telling good game stories um, in, in this genre of it's sort of like hardcore challenging games. Because if you fail at that, what ends up happening is the narrative always loses um, because the, the player gets stuck. And once the player's stuck, the only thing the player's going to try to do is move forward, and they will shed everything they have to to move forward. Yeah, that actually brings up a really good point. Like One of the ways I try to think about stories when I'm working on them with a game is, is what role the player is going to play. I don't think the player is... In terms of story, I rarely think the player is the hero. For the reasons you just said, like what makes the story compelling is, is the hero going to succeed or fail? We wait to see to find out what happens in any other storytelling medium, like movies or television, right? But with games, if I set out to kill the god of war, I know for sure I'm going to kill the god of war. I mean, I have to die 14 times before I do it, but I can do it if I just stick with it long enough, right? So it's interesting to, uh, when you're constructing a story to, to think about how the player knows it's made up and knows it's made believe, but all the other non-player characters, the NPCs, for them, this is life and death. This is real. And it's much easier to give a desire line to an NPC and then create a relationship between the player and his avatar and that NPC. So, and that relationship is usually based, in my opinion, on game mechanics. So if it's a game mechanic that involves a lot of fighting, a lot of shooting, a lot of adversarial behavior, by definition, the player is going to behave like an antagonist. 
And so it becomes much easier to create a story for a game if you, as a writer, look at it structurally and say, the player thinks it's about him, but the NPC thinks the story is about him. They are each other's antagonist. Fight. So w would you all deign to say that, like, that creating stories for games is harder than other mediums? I mean, is that something that you guys kind of hold yourself in? Self-esteem, it's a more complicated act than, I, I, you know, say... I, Go ahead, Corey. I think please. The, the proper answer that is supposed to be <laughs> is very, very diplomatic. It presents, yeah, the diplomatic it presents answer. a unique set of challenges and opportunities. I, I would not ever uh, say that it is more difficult or somehow harder. Uh, I think that we just face a very unique set of challenges, right? In addition to most of the traditional challenges faced by... by uh, people in the narrative field, you know, just very basic story, character, world construction, which are monumental tasks on their own. We then have an entire additional set of challenges in terms of the, the rules of interaction with the world. Uh, but I, I wouldn't necessarily say it makes it harder, it's just different. It's okay, you can say that it's harder. I mean, it's, we're all friends here. <laughs> <laughs> No one's going to hold that against you. I, I think that there are, are plenty of people out there that have that have worked for movies on, you know, that, that have tried to get movies made over periods of sometimes decades, or people that have, you know, slaved over working on a book for for just as long. And and I think that they would disagree if if we said the thing that we knocked out in anywhere from nine months to, to three years was somehow more difficult. Uh, when you know, so I think it depends on the person, it depends on the project. But uh, I, I will not go so far as to say that video games are objectively more difficult. Than other no, that, that's okay. I'll let I'll, I'll let it slide. We actually we have a great question. We have a great question from a from a fellow named Luke, um, which we addressed to the group. Which was, uh, you know, the one thing that you all have to deal with that um, um, writers and uh, creators and other mediums don't necessarily have to deal with is the potential to allow for open endedness. And the question for the group is, how much storytelling freedom are you willing to give? A player, uh, whether you'd be interested in crafting an open-ended story with lots of possible paths, how do you balance as a creator? And this is a challenge for lots of creators, not just video game designers. How do you balance that personal tension between wanting to control an outcome versus letting the player kind of discover that outcome for themselves? Um, Nick, maybe if you want to start. Uh, it's a it's a question that's really project to project, and it depends on the aesthetic intention of the project, because I, I think there's a very different narrative strategy when you're trying to tell an individual story that has pacing and dramatic necessity than when you're really trying to let a user go their own way. And I, I'm, you know, I, I've argued a lot recently, and I'm going to argue more vociferously every time I get the chance to, that like we absolutely ignore really dramatically powerful interactive narratives that have existed because they don't tell a single story. Like, the power of something like Dungeons and Dragons, which I could, I, every single person who's played Dungeons and Dragons could tell a story about an amazing experience they had in Dungeons and Dragons, and that's a system that produced that story. Um, but because it's not the same story, we just ignore the fact that it's, it's all came from the same system. Um, so I think that you can have open-ended story possibilities with the right system that can create really dramatic narratives, but um, and powerful narratives, not just on the drama sense. But the techniques are completely different. They actually don't share anything very much in common with what we do when we tell something more linear. So if you make The Last of Us, you're actually doing something very different than if you make Neverwinter Nights. And the techniques you use to build those things are, are completely different. I've done stuff all, all across the spectrum. Um, and I think it's really just a question of intent. You know, like, do you, do you have a particular story that you want to tell? Is this Ezio's story? And you just want to tell Ezio's story. Because Ezio's story is good. Or do you want to give people a universe in which they wander around a wasteland and figure out how they're going to respond to a post-apocalyptic uh, Las Vegas, and you don't really care what they do, um, as long as they do it in a way that matches the post-apocalyptic Las Vegas. That's, they're just very different directions. Um, and I think there's room for both of them, because they're very different experiences. Yeah, I mean, so Susan, I mean, I imagine for you, like when you know, one of the things that writers have been able to do in the past in other mediums is set something up very directly and then be able to deliver on that expectation. There are all these narrative devices that exist if you're a filmmaker or a writer. How do you, as a writer, how do you? I mean, obviously, there are certain things that you want to evoke in the player. How do you balance for you balance that creative desire to want to create a certain experience versus like? The reality that, like you're saying in Hitman, when you should be killing people, you just want to dance instead. Right. Um, I guess it's a, probably an elaboration on my earlier answer, which is that like 
I mean, when I first started working in games, I really felt like it was my job to craft an awesome story for the avatar and like drive it forward. And I'm going to write these cutscenes that are so awesome, the player's going to cry. Um, but the player never turns his brain off. He never stops being engaged, and he never stops responding to what's happening in front of him. Um, and so now I approach my job differently, and I feel like it is my job still to craft a story using the traditional tools that we have always used to tell stories to each other, because the one thing that hasn't changed is the player. Like, human beings have not suddenly made an incredible quantum leap in evolution. We still use story to understand the world, and we understand story in a certain kind of way. So I still feel like those old school techniques still apply, but um, they really have to be in the service of a, of a character who's going to buy in. And like I was saying before, the character who's most likely to buy in is going to be a non-player character, someone I can totally control as the writer. And uh, by doing that, by focusing my energy and my efforts in that arena, I really free up two people. I free up the player and I free up the game designer who kind of collaborate together to create the player's experience. And whatever they do uh, creates meaning for them and creates their story. But by creating a story inside the world, I make the world real. So that, that makes sense. The story the player creates will resonate with the world that feels real because I use story techniques to bring that world to life. Um, how about for you, Corey? I mean, when you, when you guys, were, you know, were you working on Assassin's Creed? I mean, did you guys, did you ever contemplate making? You know, those games are more directed, but you know, is that something that you guys wrestle with in terms of giving players? I mean, for sure. And there is, there has always been that conversation, uh, you know, of let's just make it more open, let's make it more emergent, let's make it more systemic, let's give the player the opportunity not just to determine, you know, where they'll go, but but who they'll be. Let's move away from the idea of a fixed protagonist. We talk about this stuff all the time. And one of the things that we that's been coming up a lot here is that we've been asking people when they start a project that for me the first question they need to be answering isn't what kind of game am I making, what kind of story do I want to tell, it's what is the experience I want to create, right? And so you can immediately have a, a, a branch at that point is do I want to tell the story of a given protagonist that is a little more linear, that is a little more traditional, that is more of a player as a voyeur, as a follower, as a, as a helper, or do I want to create an experience where the player is the protagonist, where everything that we do is in service to giving the player opportunity and choices and letting them shape the character rather than, than trying to you know shove them into the shoes of another character. And so I yeah. think once you make that decision, and it was it was like Nick and, and Susan were saying, is that you know there there's room for many different types of experiences, right? There's a reason that something like The Last of Us is huge, and it's, it's a very different reason, I think, for you know uh, from why something like Skyrim is huge. They they both provide very different sorts of experiences for the player, but I think they're both uh, absolutely viable for me. And I think it, it really hits on on what Susan was saying is that it's all about consistency. That once you've decided what kind of experience it is that you want to create, you make sure that every single element of the production serves it. And that, you know, whether it's the, the script or, or elements of game design or features of the engine, uh, aspects of art direction, you always need to be asking yourself, does this, does this element, does this feature serve the experience I'm trying to create? And if it doesn't, you have to be willing to either adapt it or remove it. And that can be really challenging too, because people, you know, fall in love. And they don't want to kill their darlings. So it can be really tough. I, Corey, um, for for you, what? Oh, go ahead, Charlie. Well, I, 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 first of all, I think that makes tremendous sense, and and Corey just sort of uh, I, that resonates, I think, in a lot of um, any great work. That is, that all the elements have an integrity to serve the the vision, the the whole. Um, but I, I wanted to ask this question, going back to what Susan started to say before about how uh, storytelling and writing has this role that we understand through civilization as a a role to help us um, better. Empathize, right? Better to, to understand our place in the world, to understand other people, um, and to to sort of have a roadmap in that way. And it makes me want to ask the question to the game designers here: um, What do you think the ultimate role uh, is for games? What what role do they play? Uh, do they help us better understand our position in the in the world? Um, well, yeah, the mechanics are designed to do that. You know, I think that, that, that a mechanic can explore these things, and, and there are mechanics that try to. If you think about indie games like uh, Paper Squeeze or what Cart Life tries to do or what, you know, even, even game-like experiences like Dysphoria try to do. I mean, it's really about building out the, um, 
building out the, uh, uh, the mechanical experience such that by actually playing the game, you experience a narrative. And that's to answer you know, an audience question that I see floating in the chat. I mean, that's where games come in. It's like games give you an ability to make decisions in a narrative. And that's something that other media don't give you. Like, that's the one thing that games have that, that nothing else has is choice. And so if a narrative exists in a game at the level of the gameplay, then the narrative exists in the choice making. And that, and that choice making can exist in any form. It could be like what I'm physically doing with my body. It could be the strategies I'm thinking through. It could be how I interpret the narrative into action. But all of that stuff is where games can come in strongly. And so a game that's a good narrative game is typically a game where the mechanic and the narrative are, are closely tied. And so there's some interaction between those two things. That could be up. And, and you know, we're, we're a smart medium, right? We're not just like trying to churn out. Um, you know, like the, like, the, like the really basic kind of uh, uh, genre fiction storylines that we ha always have been, we can be meta about that relationship. We can think about ways game mechanics can stand in an adverse relationship to the story. We can think about ways that game mechanics can observe the story and analyze the story. We can think about interesting juxtapositions, the way that, you know, when I make a film, I don't have to just simply face the camera on something. I can have the choices I make as a cinematographer interact with the script in interesting ways. Similarly, I think we can do the same thing with mechanics. So, I mean, so the question to me is always when you design interaction for a narrative purpose, what's the aesthetic of the interaction? And that, that the heart of that is the difference that games bring to the table. And ultimately, therefore, if it were designed in the right way, could lead to a much uh, deeper empathetic experience for people. Uh, I, it, it, in regards, because I saw something very interesting this week that, that really impacted me and, and what you're talking about brings it up, is that while I think you can make the argument that there's an opportunity to, to, to begin to create empathy with games, I, I get a little hesitant because the idea of I can step into someone, someone else's shoes and experience life from their point of view, remember we can always turn the game off at the end of the day and walk away from it, and I think in a lot of instances for a lot of people like and it's, it, it may sound strange to say it, but like it, it, it did impact me. If you think about even the protagonist from Cart Life, right? You know, if, if that, that immigrant experience is something that you don't get to, to walk away from when you have it and, and when everything is on the line, and it was something I also felt with Papers, Please. So there was a moment of this was really interesting, and I'm very into the idea of the, the way in which the mechanics you know, create the experience, and then you turn the game off, and there was something that really sat inside of me that was dark and uncomfortable, that was, I was able to turn this off and walk away, and there are people out there you know, that, that don't have that luxury. And so I think that's something that we just have to be sensitive to, I suppose, going forward, that we don't wind up implying that games are somehow a cure-all. It's not to say that there isn't that ability, right, or, or there isn't that opportunity to, to create better understanding and awareness. I, I guess what I'm just saying is that it will never, I don't think, and I, I think just by the nature of the way games work, there is the on-off switch. It can never truly replace um, you know, how, you know, living, living as another person or, or having a completely alternative experience. Oh yeah, but I think I think that, that what we can do is what other media do, right? We can we can ask ourselves to you know we can make like like a simple example, right? We could make uh, Ellison's Invisible Man, right? We could make a story where we where we we cast you in the role of a protagonist who's troubling, who's who's ambiguous, who's dealing with oppression in all sorts of all sorts of weirdly empowered and disempowered ways, where we're actually not sure how reliable this narrator is at the end of the day, like all of, all of that stuff we could do, and you're gonna put the book down and walk away. It's not like you know, you, you read you read Ellison and then you walk out. Suddenly, I understand the history of civil rights, but like right. you you have an experience that you didn't have elsewhere, and I think right. that can be very powerful. Absolutely. And I think that yeah, go ahead. No, and I think the games. I mean, hundred percent. Yeah, and I think the games. You know, we we're still figuring out how to do this, and whenever we try to do it, everybody freaks out, right? You know, Super Columbine Massacre comes out, and it's you know, and Danny Ladun gets like like death threats for touching a topic that film touches. Continually, and in fact, film touched the very same year with a very similar topic of, you know, elephant. This is all about, you know, a bunch of a bunch of fiction came out about the Columbine massacre, and the film came out, and people were like, oh, that's a little distasteful, and the game comes out, and it's a horror that could should never have seen the light of day. And right. I, I think that, that that's a kind of there's a sophistication there that we as a as an industry have to start to embrace and, and reach for. And I think, you know, I, I don't think we're there yet. I think that the, the games we're talking about are interesting. Papers Please is great, um, but I think. You know, ten years from now, we're going to have even more powerful work that's going to be exploring this in even deeper ways. Yes. Uh, Susan, is that something that like that you often think about when you're uh, like, what, to Charlie's point, like this idea of using games to um, 
to create transformative experiences in the players. Is that something that you explicitly set out to do with your stories, or is it kind of a positive externality for a job well, well done? Yeah, I mean, I do think about it a lot, and in fact, I actually lose sleep over it. It's, it's. Um, I mean, I think that the ability to be a transformative experience it can only happen when the mechanics and the story, when the content and the behavior really work together in a way to kind of where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, and one of the challenges I think that the industry is uh, been grappling with and and changing. So I, if, I want to say this with the caveat that like this is evolving, this isn't static. But um, you know when you play a game uh, where it is incredibly violent and the the emotional experience of the game, the feeling of the game is one of fun. You know you, you create those that situation where you know your your neurons are firing in your brain and the and the ones that fire together wire together and. I think that uh, game developers are such sophisticated, smart, thoughtful, intelligent men and women, and I see game developers now exploring ways of, of creating an emotional experience using mechanics in a new kind of way, and I think like Papers, Please is a, is a great example of, of something that sort of creates a different experience, right, than um, something that's just like a, a shoot them up, go crazy, have fun uh, experience. I think that we're sort of expanding our vocabulary of what... Uh, uh, emotional states we can transfer from developer to player. And so that to me is really exciting. And I think story has a role to play in there. Story doesn't drive game development. <laughs> I think, Corey, everyone here is backing <laughs> up on that one. Uh, and that's usually the first question I get from writers from other mediums. Like, well, you start with the story and then you build the game around it. <laughs> Not so much. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I think this story has a role to play, but I think it really comes down to that, like the, the Venn diagram, the overlap between gameplay and story or content. You know, where does it overlap? It doesn't. It's not a big overlap, but where that that emotional experience happens, that's where the potential for transformation lies. Yeah, I, I think for for me as a player, I think one of the one of the challenges is that you know oftentimes the, the games that we mentioned. So Papers Please, for those of you who don't know, you don't know, you play as a a border guard checking pass. It's basically a fact-checking game. Uh, if, if there are any copy editors out there, you basically are checking passports to decide who comes into. I guess ostensibly it's an Eastern European country, and you have to make these really hard choices. I found for me, and this is one of the challenges. I'm willing to like turn on Netflix and watch Breaking Bad or you know anti-hero stories or House of Cards, which you know shows some like, pretty brutal emotional interactions. I find for myself as a player, and this dovetails with a question that we received from uh, from Merzad, which is like dealing with these real life issues, you know, whether it's racial politics or injustice, for me can be really hard for me to want to turn on and be like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna spend a lot of time turning people away from a border and sending them off to you know unknown gloom and doom, or like, oh, I'm gonna have to you know play a game which you know involves me making these heart wrenching decisions. I mean, do you think that that is a like a cognitive bias that people have as players, or is it something about the nature of like, the way we think about games? Or I just I find for me as a player, it can be very hard for me to voluntarily want to do the really tough thing in games. Uh, can I just say I don't think it's very different at all because if you look at the box office results of the movies that won like Best Picture and were nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars, and you compare them to the box office results of the blockbusters that are out now, it is astounding how little those Oscar award-winning movies were watched compared to these blockbusters. So I actually think it's, it's a general audience drive. I mean, I, I think that we're not in any unusual position relative to other media that people don't want to see dark and potentially disturbing stuff all the time. Uh, I, I think that like we're suffering from what everybody else is suffering from. We just don't have the same network of culture and press and audience that, that supports that kind of play yet. But I think as we make more games that do it, we're going to start to see that that differentiation. But I think if the dream is that everyone's going to want to consume really challenging, difficult work that problematizes their role in life, I think we're going to have to go back through all the other media and solve that problem there first. I, I do think we do have one additional challenge, though, because games are interactive, is that there is that ask of the player to be complicit in, in something uncomfortable. I think it's easier, uh, potentially. I would have to measure it. It would be kind of cool to see a study that I think it might be easier to get by if you ask someone to watch something uncomfortable versus asking someone to participate in something uncomfortable or something that, that you know, may result in something unpleasant. I suspect that the solution to that would be to ease them in um, but you know that could wind up having a, an even more disturbing outcome at the end if, if what starts off as an innocuous uh, 
exercise and pattern matching suddenly is revealed to be some sort of terrible, uh, you know, ethnic cleansing simulator. So <laughs> I, I do think that the the ask of the the audience to to touch that that sensitive subject may may cause a, a bit of additional recoil. But I do agree with you, right? The numbers for, for film are, are much higher when it's go into the theater, turn off your brain and watch things explode versus go into the theater. And, and you know, I, I thought that uh, Dallas Buyers Club was one of the, was for me at least best film of last year. And I don't think that as many people as I would have liked to have seen it saw it. So, so I agree with your point. Yeah, I, I mean, personally, I know I was a little upset that Fast and Furious 6 was not nominated for Best Picture. <laughs> Six movies in a row. I think that, you know, really that's a missed opportunity by the judges. Uh, I'm Special sorry. award for longevity. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> longest, longest, longest runway in movie history, right? Uh, so uh, we, <laughs> we're almost at, uh, at 40 minutes. We have one more question. Uh, just one more question for you all. Um, I, you know, as you you are thinking about honing your craft in the coming uh, you know days, months, years, etc. I was wondering, you know, what new horizons for games um, have we not yet reached? Like when you're thinking about your next work, where are the places that games have yet to go um, that you're really excited about as a as a creator? Um, maybe start with uh, with Nick. Um, I I mean not to not to. To, to riff off uh, Merzad here, but I, I think that, that games have been very reluctant to show the complexities of human experience in a deep way. And I think that we're seeing more of that as, as games are growing up, but I, I think there's so much potential to explore that, particularly from ambivalence. I think that games, you know, like the, once you start making the separation between the player and the protagonist, you can actually start seeing that the, the protagonist's goals can be ambivalent. Um, and not just bad and not just good, but problematized in interesting ways. And I think exploration of that, particularly as we approach commentary on the real world, is where I think we're going to get a lot of power out of games. And, I, and, I, and the thing I really want to see, honestly, um, which I think you know, Last of Us is striving towards and, and, and more things are striving towards from games, is a Children of Men. Right? I want to see a story that's about the end of the world. I want to see a story that's about the kinds of things that games do. But that, that grabs me at an emotional level that's so deep in my interaction, which I think is where Last of Us, that's the next step beyond Last of Us, um, where my interaction makes me feel like the ambivalence, the challenge, the deep humanity of what I'm doing is impactful. I think that's a, it's a really, given that we're kind of talking in the AAA space right now, I think that's a really interesting space for us to explore. And I, I think we're going to get there. I think that people in this, in this Hangout, and I think people in studios right now are working on that. So it's an exciting time to be in the medium. Susan, how about for you? Um, I have probably an unusual answer, given that I'm a writer, but I'm actually really interested in seeing more games that involve more full-body experiences. I think that um, I think that uh, our minds lie like a two-bit rug, and I think that our bodies really tell the truth about who we are and what we're feeling towards ourselves and towards the world and towards each other. And I would love to create a game experience that uses more physical behavior and then created a story that um, kind, of, kind of conflicted with that. Because I think that's where I think story becomes really interesting and where an experience becomes really interesting when you know there's more going on than meets the eye. So to your point, Breaking Bad, that's such a great example of like presenting this guy who seems as harmless as can be, and yet when he's, when he's up against the wall, he reveals himself to be more than even he thought he was. I would love to see a game that, that creates an experience from the neck up that is different than the experience from the neck down. Corey, how about for you? What 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 do you think is the the thing that, the last thing? I am very interested in the disappearance of the controller or the 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 merging, and I, I guess it sort of speaks to what Susan was saying: the merging of the controller with with the with the person doing the controlling. That, we are that, the original joystick. Yeah. So that, you know, <laughs> I, I think I talked about it a little bit at the the end of the short film. That idea of shrinking the gap between the, the person behind the screen and the content that's on the screen. And so I don't know if it's in the direction of the Oculus Rift. I don't know if it's in the direction of, of software that is smarter and more responsive than what we have now and is able to better deal with edge cases rather than you know constantly showing us the edges of the simulation. I don't know what direction it lies in, but I think the again the, the if we can get the if we can make the controller disappear then we're that much closer to, to truly immersing a player rather than asking for a series of suspensions of disbelief. 
Lovely. Those are all great answers. I, I mean, certainly, you know, with you all at the helm, uh, I have no doubt that those things will come to fruition. Uh, I personally like to see more comedy in games. Like, comedy is really hard to do intentionally, so I know it's something I'm certainly looking forward to. <laughs> but it's so easy to uh, do unintentionally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I'm just such a funny guy in person. It's just so natural. So uh, <laughs> I still want to see a musical. I still want to see a ah. musical. Yeah, that would be rad. Exactly. That's where the dancing and the singing comes in. I know. I'm with you. Let's do yeah. it. We talk about a cabaret. Yeah. Just for cabaret something. the game. Please. <laughs> some, where do I sign up for that? I'm available. Some crazy new form of Space Channel 5, right? We'll reinvent oh. Space Channel 5, but with what it should have been. <laughs> I'll get, the, uh, here, <laughs> I'll get the Kickstarter ready for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Charlie, I guess you, you want to take us home. Yeah, I just want to say to thanks for everyone. This is so inspiring and fun. I can't wait to see the stories that you guys all create. Um, and thank you for participating in today's Hangout. Uh, please come back and join us. We do one of these every Wednesday. Uh, and look forward to having you be part of the Future of Storytelling Summit this October 1st and 2nd. So, uh, again, cheers, thanks. This was great fun. Look forward to look forward to much more. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 <laughs> See you guys.